everybody. Rod is having technical difficulties at his house. So he hopefully will be joining us soon, but I figured we would go ahead, go live. I am joined by ABC Matt below me and then Cam Cameron Bowser is Caddy Corner. Neither one of these guys have been on before, so we're excited. Their links to yeah. their channels are in the description and Marsha will be dropping them in the chat for you guys as well. So definitely check them out and I'm going to make them big and let them introduce your introduce yourself introduce themselves and then we'll get your questions so here's matt hi guys i'm abc matt i'm a hobby reseller i source via mass transit and i um on instagram and youtube and i sell on ebay poshmark and whatnot perfect here's cam what's going on guys i am cam or cameron bowser if you don't know i'm a 23 year old full-time reseller and i've been doing this basically my whole life and I'm just here to show you guys exactly what I find but not only that just so everybody can get knowledge too so hopefully everybody learns perfect and Marsha just dropped their links down in the chat all right so we have this chat this this question was put in really early by Daryl and Daryl wants to know what's the least expensive shipping option for a seller to ship single four by six photos so he's saying he tried the large envelope option I think that's a, the new eBay option but it doesn't come up as an option when he's printing the labels he says so it's allowing him to choose it but it's not letting him print it I would, I would be careful with that. If you go to the gym or something, I mean, you can't even put cardboard or stuff like that to protect the photo. It might be a little dicey. So I'm not sure. I don't have any, any history with it. Cam, do you do any smaller stuff like that? <laughs> so, my bad, sorry, it like lagged. For um, that type of stuff, man, I really only do like clothing, so I just stick it in a bag and that's it. But if I had to do that with a photo, I guess, yeah, you would probably end up doing like an envelope because it's like cardboard, you know? Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think your cheapest way you can't print on eBay. I think you would have to like get an envelope buy the postage at the post office and then add tracking, which is like 59 cents. So I feel like it would be like a dollar fifty. But for me, and I do sell single postcards and single photos, I just do ground advantage. I have them pay five dollars and the buyer's paying, so I'm not really worried about it. And you have to make sure you have tracking or eBay's not going to be able to verify that your buyer got it. So that's the thing you want to be safest with. And like, I wouldn't want to go to the post office, buy the postage, and then add the tracking. But you could, if you, if you want to do that, you can. And I, there are some sellers that ship without tracking i just that's not something i do i think you probably couldn't even get top rated seller because you have no proof of shipping and tracking if you're doing that but i see sellers doing like dollar shipping and stuff and i would assume that's what they're doing um but i am not sure it All should right. only cost like five bucks right to do that yeah it's yeah it's actually i think the cheapest like for three ounce is like three dollars and seventy cents, so like four dollars. But now, like eight ounce rate, it's crazy. From like eight ounce rate from Florida to Seattle is like eight bucks now for eight ounces. Like the prices have really jumped like this year quite a bit, and it sucks for that light like stuff, especially if it's like ten and fifteen dollars stuff, and they have to pay like nine dollars for shipping. So. Yeah, it sucks. Um, Seaside, so um, the eBay standard envelope is what they were saying. And I don't know if you can help if you're familiar using it. None of us use it. But they're saying that they chose that and then it wouldn't let them print that label when they went to print it out on eBay. So if you use it and you guys can help them, please let them know in the chat because none of us here on the panel actually use it. Um, but they're saying they couldn't get it to print. Or if you guys know of any YouTubers that have done videos on how to print them, maybe pop that in there as well. I don't I don't use them, so it's hard for me to kind of walk somebody through it. Uh, Miss Patty wants to know, when doing a store sale, 
what is the wording? And I don't think it's wording to omit newly listed items. Do any, like, do you guys know how to remove like your newly listed stuff on a sale? I'm not sure. Are, are, are you talking about like when you do like special coupons and discounts like that? I mean, when yeah, I'm going to hold on. I'll, I'll share here. I'll try. Okay. I'll try. And let's see if I can. Well, let's see if I can walk my way through this. Um, so if the items that you want. So to if you on. go to Markdown sale. And then create a promotion, sale event and markdown. And I put everything in mine. So you can put like take 30% off, select items. Let's I, I have no clue what I'm doing right now. Okay. Um select items. There's a way. Oh, days on site. Yeah, Look. You could probably go to the how old they've been. So like let's one. put 90 days to like 365 and filter. So I wouldn't be able to do this because I have 2,700 items that are between three months and a year and you can only do 2,000. So what you do is right here, Patty, you're going to go to days on site and you could, if you don't, you could put like 31. So if they've been listed more than a month to a year, or you could put like 700. Dun, 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 it's going to go up <laughs> 4,100. Um, and then you can so, start yeah. descending or descending for the time. Yeah, and then you could just sort like and pick those, but you can only pick 2,000 that way. And I just have too many listings. Um, I have 7,000 listings, so for us that wouldn't work. Hey. But if you don't have 7,000 listings, then that would work. You could pick how many ever days. I've never tried to do it that way because I put my sale on everything, but yeah. Um, oh, I should have just left that up. Okay. Miss Diane wants to know how to refund. Hold on, I will show you exactly how to do that. We might as well take a little field trip here uh, again. Easy, that's easy. Yeah, yeah so if yeah. you just go to your orders on the computer, you, you can do it on your phone now, but if you, I've shipped all the, let's see. So if you go to view order details, all you do is click here more actions, scroll down and hit send refund. And then you can send them. A, and when you click this, I don't need to refund these people. But one of the reasons is a shipping discount. So super, yeah. super easy to do that. Don't, I, I will tell you guys, don't refund before you ship because it will take it out of your items to be shipped if you've sent even a partial refund. So yeah. I always tell everybody like, hey, I'll send you the refund for the shipping overage after I ship. Because if we do it before, it disappears out of that list. You could still print a label, but it would be a pain in the butt. It's not going to come up in like your bulk labels and things like that. Um, hold on. You said oh, you have 7,000? I have, look, now I closed eBay again. I think I have 7,100. Um, let's see. Uh, we have 7036 listed. Ooh. But you got to figure I have one full time employee and one part time employee, too. I actually I want I'm so scared. I'll I'll mess up my camera. I'm not going to do it. I have 10 of these. Hold on. Let's see if I can grab one. He does it anyway. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh. 10 of these full of vintage t-shirts that somebody messaged me and asked me if I wanted to buy. That's actually one of them is stacked there. So the whole floor and the shed is covered, but they'll be listed in a week is a crazy thing. Wow. <laughs> like we list about 150 a week, typically 150 oh. to 250 a week, depending on how busy we are shipping. Like if we're shipping a lot, then we won't like I have a part timer who just does listings. So she lists 100 a week every week. And then it depends on how busy we are shipping, how yeah. many my full time employee gets up. But and what kind of stuff it is. But this is all vintage teas and vintage linens. All right. Let's see. What's your best liquidation strategy when you just want to move stuff? Would you auction as lots, yard sale, or what would you do if you were wanting to move a bunch of inventory? 
I would do lots. Um, if let's say if I have, for instance, I have a Alf the TV show uh, box set and it's just sitting there, I'll lot it up with maybe a plushie of Alf mm -hmm. and say, hey, you know, you get a package deal with this. Um, but also the platform I would use if if you have whatnot, whatnot in my opinion is great to sell in volume. Um, you as long as you have the understanding, you won't get the maximum value yeah. like eBay. You could turn a lot of items really fast on whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I would say definitely when it comes to basically turning or liquidating it fast, I would really just try to drop your prices or listings together. And honestly, if it's an item that I truly don't even like care for specifically, like as in I don't really care how much money I'm gonna get for it, I'll just throw it up as auction. And normally the auction is just gonna go and if it sells for whatever, I'll be happy, you know? Yeah, for me, I don't really liquidate. Like I, if I decide I really don't want it, I'm going to give it away. Um, I have people yeah. that sell at the flea market and I'll just tell them to take everything. I have been doing, um, I have been doing 50% off on some stuff that's been listed over a year when I get watchers. So I think if you have watchers on stuff, send really high offers off on the stuff <laughs> wolfman says i use a dumpster see i would rather give it to my flea market people and let them make like 50 cents or a buck on it <laughs> like they and they come and take it all away so you know yeah. i would rather do that um but i don't i don't really liquidate a ton i do sell on whatnot um i haven't been selling as much because the prices i feel like have fallen with saturation of sellers um, so I haven't been selling as much on there, but I might do some like reseller lots on there to try and switch it up a little bit what I'm selling. Let's see. Susan says, well, vintage necklaces that tested glass on stones that are different design and colors be worth more than plastic. I'm thinking yes, but how much more? I am thinking neither of you guys do jewelry, right? I just started. You got it. I don't know anything. I just okay. started. So yeah, a glass is going to be more valuable than plastic. As far as how much it really is going to depend on the piece, um, like vintage glass can sell high, but if it is newer glass, <laughs> Rod has arrived. If it's newer glass, uh, it's, I mean, it's still going to be more than plastic, but you might only be talking a few dollars. And there's some plastic and Lucite pieces that sell for a lot as well. So it's a really hard to answer that without a specific piece. Um, which is the case with a lot of things and be able to know like how much more it's worth. MC Han said, I started my eBay side hustle to stay home with my first baby and now I'm about to have our second. How do I put my 730 item store on maternity leave for at least six weeks? Wow, I never put my store past to the two week portion i mean i would put it on time away but i'm not too sure if you do six weeks how detrimental that is yeah um when it comes to taking the break um there's a limit what you can only take two weeks for like your vacation is that what it is you I'm can not... still get sales for two weeks yeah. but you can yeah. i think the time away isn't the time away limit 30 days though yeah, like you might be able to like do your 30 days and then that next day just be active for like a day and then the next day just go on vacation again. I mean, my suggestion would be just literally end all your items and then they'll stay in your they'll stay unlisted for 90 days. And then when you when you're about a week ready to get back into it, that week before, list them all but as brand new listings because that's gonna really trigger the algorithm for you. And I think that's probably the most beneficial thing. You know, that would be my what I would do if I was in that situation, if I went, went away or if I was on vacation or traveling. Yeah, you could. And um, I do want to say, because I just saw this on the top of drafts. So we discussed a few weeks ago, like the max amount of drafts is 250 before they start trashing them. The limit for them being in there is 75 days. So be careful if you're leaving drafts. I actually had somebody I'm coaching that lost all of her drafts because oh. they're only there for 75 days. So be very, very careful that it doesn't go over that 75 day mark. Um, I like I have lists perfectly, so I would be able to end them all and then pop them all back up after six weeks if I wanted to. 
but and I 30 day is the limit, but the problem would be if you did it and then you got sales. I don't, I think you're going to hit the algorithm negatively by ending them all in the first place. And if you end them, make them live for 12 hours and then end them again, you're going to double whammy yourself. So it'd yeah. probably be better just to end them and then relist them all. I mean, honestly, if I were you, I would. I mean, you would, it may be more beneficial to you even sign for List Perfectly for like a month or so, a month or two, get List Perfectly. Then you can transfer all that information on List Perfectly because what happens if you have some type of, God forbid, you have some type of complications or if you need more time than six weeks or something else arises, you know, that way you you are paying for that, that peace of mind, that benefit. Because if you take off one month, you take off six months, at least List Perfectly will save all those listings for you. Yeah. And that's more of a safety measure for you with those listings. So that's what I would, any, if it, that'd be my and recommendation. You could just get the lowest plan. Yeah. yeah. And, and that would be my recommendation. Anyone that's going to be taking a significantly time away from your, your, your business. And just in case of any, you know, life happens, things get in the way. And if you need more time, at least you don't have to worry about it. And, you know, everything's saved in there. And then you can just do a master list them all or, you know, list, you know, 20 a day, or whatever you want to do, getting right back into it. Yeah, and the deal, I yeah, it code the nurse flipper if you guys want to try list perfectly, you can get thirty percent off the first month. Um, it I, it's a really like good way to save your listings, and they're there forever, and there's no limit is the nice thing. I know a lot of places limit you on listings, but they do not have a limit. Uh, the timeless rose vintage says if you sell watches or have sold them. Do you test them all? I had a sweet buyer send me a bunch of vintage jewelry for free and I have all the watches left. So she hasn't done anything with them. I've sold watches before. If, if I have the battery, I do test them. But if I don't, if I'm lazy or I just don't want don't want to be bothered testing that, I do say I, it's untested. Um, I, I'll be honest with them. I'm like, hey, I got it at a state sale. Um, I haven't tested it in the description or something. That way I'm honest to them so then they can make their decision from there. I don't really sell watches and jewelry, <laughs> but if I had to agree with Matt, I would definitely agree. Like, honestly, just disclosing the thing, like wherever you got it, if you got it from a thrift store, honestly, if you just tell them, hey, I got it from a thrift store, some people are really just happy to have the disclosure of where it came from, you know? So I probably would just, yeah, put it in there and then rock with that. So for me, I bought that massive Disney collection and I got like 50 or 60 like vintage Disney watches, you know, from the 80s, 90s, and None of them are working. They're all, all the batteries are dead. So I just throw them up on eBay. I throw them on eBay, throw them on my whatnot. And I say, listen, untested. It's a collectible watch. You're going to need replaced battery. More than likely it's going to work because the battery's dead. But, you know, I'm just selling it as is because I don't want to waste the time taking them out or have to deal with swapping the batteries. Time is money. And a lot of people just want the collectible watches. Now, it's different when it's a watch they're going to wear. But sometimes with like the collectible watches, they just want the watch regardless if it works or not. But, Rod, so are you concerned with uh, like, the erosion on the on the watches though no because i'm selling it as is okay yeah so i get watches sometimes in my jewelry lots what i do is i comp all of them if they are worth 50 dollars or more working i save them and my jeweler will install new batteries for ten dollars each it's normally 15 but if i bring them more than 10 watches They'll do it for $10 a piece. And if it's worth $50, then I bring them to the jeweler. If it's not worth 50, it's as is, not tested, might need new battery. And then he actually, so he won't charge me. If he puts a battery in and the watch doesn't work, I don't get charged. So those watches, I actually still am able to sell. I put need repair and I put that a battery did not make the watch function. And if they were worth 50 bucks working, someone still might want it for a collector's item or to try and fix it. But I let them know that I tried a battery. I don't want to tell them, oh, it needs a battery when I know the battery won't fix it. But we tried changing them ourselves and that was a hot mess with the little pieces. Like I'm oh, too yeah. old for all that crap. Like it just, it was a mess. So we just save them until we get 10 worth over 50 bucks, bring them the jeweler and then um, run them. I will tell you, I had issues with one that I put as is tested and eBay will force it if they say not as described. So I did have to take it back, but then I knew the thing didn't work and I just put that in my listing when I relisted it. So 
Cat, yeah. what's the turnaround time for your jeweler to, to uh, knock the, all those out for you? The You're next like, day, oh. it's crazy. I bought them like oh, brought wow. them like 20, 25 watches, and they have them ready like the next morning. It's oh, just wow. like a little jewelry shop, like in a shopping center by me, okay. and. You can go in and like they told me 15 a piece and I told them like I'm a reseller. I buy lots. What if I bring more? So that's when they told me if I brought in 10 or more, they would do it for 10 bucks a watch. And but again, if it's a twenty five dollar watch, I'm not paying ten dollars for a battery like it, they have to be worth over 50 in order for me to do it. But then I can say test it. And a lot of them have been like seventy five hundred bucks. And I know like, hey, it has a new battery. It's tested. It's working. And I don't have to worry about the returns at all, which is nice. Yeah, it's not. I mean, for those, I mean, that's what they do for a living. So they knock those things out super fast, probably, and quick turn them around yeah. and it's easy. Yeah, like me trying to do it, like we bought like the magnifying glass and all the different batteries. And it was like such, it was a mess. Like, and we couldn't get some of them back together. And then some of them are like fancy and have hard. I, don't, I just bring them the jeweler. Bring them the jeweler. Call it done. Um, Seaside Crafter wants to know, do you have to have an eBay store to have a sale or a bulk sale? Um, I have did eBay since 1999, and I only recently made it into a store. I mean, I've sold stuff that were, it was in an eBay store. Bulk sale, I don't know, but you definitely can make sales. Uh, you don't have to have an eBay store. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to. Like, my parents have, like, I run my parents' store, and, like, it's not a store. It's just, like, you get to like a certain point to where like you have to level it up to a store, like if you're making a certain amount, but like if you don't have to, it's it's not even a requirement. I wouldn't even bother until eBay literally says, Hey, you gotta spend an extra I think it's like what, ten bucks a month or something? Like it's it's yeah. nothing. Yeah, the basic cool. store. Yeah. So it's you get two I think it was a two hundred fifty listings for free per month. And I think that they're referring to you if they want to do a bulk sale, like a store-wide sale, stuff like that. You would have to have a store. Oh, to yeah, do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You can promote without a store, yeah. we learned, but you can't run a sale without yeah. a store. Yeah. So, you know, those are those are people out there that are, you know, just like Matt was talking about, he didn't have a store for the longest time or came with his parents there. You know, it, it's a numbers game. So, you know, you get, I think, 250 free listings before, you know, you would have to pay up for a store. And then you would just have to see what they charge you per listing how many listings you can get away before you would you would it'd be smart for you to go up to the next level there. So it's just a math yeah. equation I always just tell people when they when they are debating about getting a store or not, but it's well worth it, especially if you have the above the basic store because you do get a sh shipping supply discount every month. You know, you get 25 yeah. bucks depending on the store you're at. Um, me and Kat at the 59.99 a month. So we get a $50 credit every quarter that we can spend to get more supplies. So technically we're paying like a what 110 or no way, that'd be what 130 bucks. For three months and then you know with the with that because you get that fifty dollar discount for supplies which yeah. is nice yeah um yeah it it's i think if you have over 250 it's worth it if if you're wanting to run a sale you could just get that cheap i think there's even a 5.99 one too that you can get spice treasure want to know matt is that cannon beach behind you it is i live in portland oregon so it's about a two-hour drive to the beach that's nice. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Molly wants to know if anyone is having any issues on eBay with shipping policies acting erratic if you try to make a change. I honestly don't use shipping policies. I don't do enough to do policies. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I know like the numbers have been fluctuating, like uh, how much it costs to ship stuff. But yeah, when it comes to like policies, I just kind of go with what like the numbers give me like i know i know uh, ground advantage has been going crazy it's been like cheap one day and all of a sudden two weeks later it's been raised a few cents at least on my screen is it's, it's weird it's definitely so, so I, I do use shipping policies and i have no issues with my, my policies at, at the current moment um for those that don't know like shipping policies, you can set the shipping rates automatically for you know like if you're going to automatically do ground advantage or whatever it be you know i'm going to calculate ground advantage for all your listings um, but then it, the good thing about shipping policy is you can actually go through and, and bulk change or bulk edit everything at one time when you have a shipping policy. But I had no issues on my side. What about you, Kat? I don't use them because somebody scared the living daylights out of me years ago and said they'll jack stuff up. And so I don't use them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't. Um, 
Do you ship to Alaska and or Hawaii? I switched to calculated shipping, but I removed shipping to Alaska and Hawaii because I would have to pay expensive return shipping. Um, I have shipped things to Hawaii before. Um, I usually tell them like, hey, um, I did I do the calculated shipping. Usually it, it gives me a good buffer. Um, but when I use Shippo to ship stuff, some people use Pirate Ship or what have you. Shippo, at least, it, it shows you all the options. It was the cheapest, was the most expensive, and everything like that. And um, you know, I, I just stay in communication with them. I'm like, hey, you paid X amount of shipping. I paid. Actually, the shipping costs this amount. So if if there's any excess, I'll you know I'll gladly refund you some. I mean, it's a long way. So I I, I guess I'll do them a favor and do customer service and you know keep in contact with them. Yeah, I pretty much ship anywhere like North America. I somewhat do the global shipping, but yeah, uh, Hawaii and stuff. I kind of I kind of do ship there a lot. Uh, I do understand with the return shipping, but that can be avoided if you go in your shipping preferences and put like to where the the buyer has to pay shipping back. To where like like I, I could sell an item and then if he wants to return it, by all means, if he wants to return it, he has to pay money back to get it back to me. Yeah. As long as I know it's not like a faulty product or, you know, I mean, I sell clothing, so there's not really a lot of things that can go wrong, but. <laughs> so Cameron, how many items have you actually had returned from, from Kauai? From Hawaii? Shipping, yeah. I mean, you said you shipped to Hawaii a lot. I mean, have you had any returns? No, I don't. I've been, the thing is I ship, I, I do like almost. A little over like 12 items a day. I couldn't even, I don't even know, to be honest. But I would say, like I said, all my preferences are literally, if they want to return it, they have to pay it back. So I I, I win no matter what. Yeah. yeah. Well, I asked that question because I've been shipping probably, I've been selling eBay since 1999. I probably I can tell you kind of one hand or two hands how many times I've shipped to Hawaii and Alaska. It's not very often. Yeah. And if you're yeah. worried about getting a return, I mean that that comes down to your just your what you're shipping now. Am I going to ship like a a TV or a grill or something like that to Alaska? No, or, or Hawaii? No. So I can see that you know I would ship smaller items, T-shirts, other items on there. But I'm not worried about returns anywhere. I mean I ship global, international. Like I don't care about that because I know I'm going to you know pack ship that as well. I'm going to prepare stuff well. I'm going to ship it out, and you know you might just be hurting yourself getting sales that people want it. I will tell you, they will pay for that shipping. They don't care. And Cam makes a good point. You know, if you're going to ship to those places, just put buyer page return shipping. So as long, as long as you're not shipping like breakable glass that you're worried about, it's going to get broken because they're playing soccer and they're going to they're going to drop over a plane and just throw it right on the <laughs> island. Like, you know, then they had, then I'd be worried. But other than that, like, I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, I do yeah, want to say. I do want to say one thing. I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, you're I, fine. My my parents recently bought like a glass like gorilla statue i'm talking like it was like this big it was definitely some weight so it actually the guy i charged shipping for like a hundred bucks on their account right and it ended up being way less than what i was supposed to like charge right and i ended up texting the guy it was coming it was going from florida where i am all the way to washington like basically just diagonal you know and yeah basically what rod says if you like if somebody really wants an item yeah, just contact them. People really do, you know. And this guy, like, he paid an extra like hundred dollars just to get it shipped to him, just because he really wanted it. It's, yeah, yeah, it's bizarre. People it's buy. Bizarre. I mean, when I ship stuff international, if you guys ever look, and I don't know if you guys can ever see it, but sometimes when someone buys something from you through the global shipping program, you can actually see sometimes like a quick snippet of what they're actually paying. Oh yeah, for those a lot. It's and, a lot. Man, I, I showed a um, a candelabra. It was like um. Ursula from Disney. It was like this vast, massive thing. And I ship, I had to ship it to France. And let me tell you that that buyer paid like 240, I think it was like 240 or 140 or whatever. I think it was like, no, I think it was like 240 for shipping because I had to ship it to the U S and the thing was massive, just a weird, awkward box, but they wanted it so bad. They're going to pay for it. And that's yeah. how collectors are. And people want it. You know? Yeah. And people are putting in here, I think it can be very detrimental if you worry about all the what ifs in this business, mm -hmm. because that stuff doesn't happen very often. I will tell you, listen, my returns right now are 
friggin' crazy. There are seven of them, a thousand dollars in return. Oh. Like, and we never had like never. And it's shoes that had the friggin' size. It's yeah. clothes that had measurements. <laughs> like it's like I, I might do a video on it because like it's got me wanting to pull my hair out. Um, it is like, and it's like when it rains, it pours, but that's like this one period of time over four years, you know, like typically we have one or two returns open. We sell a hundred items a week. It's like one to 2% right now. It's, it's, it's a pain in my butt. Um, and every time one opens, I'm like, Rah! Um, yeah, yeah, I might do it and show you guys the reasons and show you the listing, but see, then it's going to give you more of this scared, <laughs> like make you more scared. It'll happen. That's the only longer. thing, <laughs> um, which is not something I try to do, but, um, it happens. It's part of business. People will send back broken stuff, It do, but it's like, it's less than a percent of the time. And if you worry about that, I guess that's my, my big point. If you worry about it, you're going to cut yourself off from sales and making the most money you can make. If you okay. worry about all the what ifs. This, that are, perspective. I mean, how many items have you sold in the last 90 days on, on your account? You know what 1100. I mean? like, 1100. So I mean, if you get, I mean, look at the percentages of that. I mean, that's, you know, less than a 1% of your, I mean, that's like a, yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, like, it's definitely less than 1%. Percent. But it sucks when it comes in waves. Cause I always feel like everything on eBay comes yeah. in waves. Yeah. Sales come in waves, returns come in waves. Yeah, but it's normally three, three not like come, 10. Come I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's a little excessive this time. Um, I wanted to throw this up here cause I, I don't necessarily appreciate what not's return policy. And I'm going to tell you why, uh, and then everybody else can kind of like jump in on that. So what I hate is the sellers don't know. I have no clue who's returning what, and I feel like there are serial buyers and returners on whatnot that could be hurting a seller's metrics, and you have no idea. Like, I would rather know because if somebody is returning stuff over and over to get that refund, I would rather know so I could block those suckers because I sure as hell would. Um, so I do not like, e I, I don't like it because the sellers aren't informed of what's going on on the back end, but I guarantee you what not has metrics on us that we don't know about and they could hurt us. Do you think you've got, I mean, you've sold, 20,000 items and whatnot. Do you think you've gotten a bunch of returns over the, over that time period? I know of the ones that tell me, and I guarantee yeah. you if people are telling me there's ones that people are not. Yeah. Um, and like I said, my concern with it is serial returners because a lot of times whatnot won't make them return it. They just give them their money back. And so if somebody learns that and they're a crappy person, you know, and I'm sure whatnot keeps metrics on the buyers as well, you know, but I just don't like that we aren't like informed and we don't see the metrics of that. And we don't see who like on eBay, I know who's returning it why they're returning it. It's coming to me on whatnot. You return it to whatnot. You don't return it to your seller. You return it to whatnot's headquarters, not the seller, hmm. unless the seller directly handles a return, which I have done. I have done. And then I just PayPal them the money, but whatnot returns, go to whatnot. And I, I believe I heard that whatnot runs sales with them. And I'm sure they're checking, like if there's sellers selling, you know, the fake, we were talking about that a few weeks ago, they are sending it into whatnot and whatnot's checking to see like, okay, is this like a fake Louis Vuitton what? bag or what? What are they doing with those items? Are they running sales? I heard today? they sell them. Where? I don't know. Probably on whatnot. <laughs> Where else would they sell them? <laughs> I mean, do you think, uh, do you th I mean, what not still in this infancy stage? Do you think they're going to evolve to be more like eBay with their policies? I think they should be more yeah. transparent with the sellers. And like, we should know if somebody's yeah. opening a return and the reason. And the, the thing being is like, somebody can go say like this jewelry's fake, right? And we have, we can't even defend ourselves. Yeah. Like, I can't be like, hey, look, I tested this thing. It's not like, and that's a strike on my whatnot, which I'm not, I'm not selling on there that much. So I'm not overly, but like that, 
And again, I want to know, like, if people are opening returns, if it's like something like it broke or something, I get that. And if people message me, a lot of times I did have them send it to me and I just paid them, which is not whatnot's policy. Whatnot's policy is whatnot handles it. But um, no. So what they do is they have the buyer send it back. They give the buyer the money and the seller keeps the money as well is how that works. Um, So whatnot is out. But I think that we should know, like, I feel almost like it's an accusation against the seller and we should be able to defend ourselves. Like, especially if they're saying it's fake or like I've sold stuff with defects that I clearly pointed out while live. And then people want to return it for that exact reason. I'm like, no, like it's an auction. Auctions are absolute. It's as is. You saw it on camera. Like, no. But you can't tell them no. Like, what not just accepts it. Wow. You know, so like it's it's great if you're a buyer because you're going to get your money back. But it's as a seller, I I don't like it. I am not not happy with it. Uh, Lisa, I do not know how you tell if something is Lucite. I can tell by looking at stuff if it's Lucite. Lucite's just a type of plastic. Um, there's not like a test like there is for Bakelite where you can use semi-chrome. Um, I don't know if somebody in the chat that's a little more knowledgeable than me might be able to help, but there's no test like there is for Bakelite. All right. I don't know if any of us sell records or vinyl, I do. but if you do in the chat, let her know. Um, if you sell vinyl, do you listen to them first or you just look for scratches? I, I actually inspect it to see if there's any scratches and I also play it. And then I also inspect the cover and the slip just to make sure what the condition is. And because you have to disclose that, you have to disclose what the cover, is it damaged or not, the slip inside that you put the record in, and also if there's any scratches or any skips on the record. So it's best to test them if you have a record player. If not, then you gotta unfortunately stay untested. But Matt, are you testing like a $10 record? I test them all. See, like me, if it's 10 bucks, even if it's 20 bucks, I'm not going to test it. I don't sell records, but like I figure it's not worth my time. So I, whoops, I'm clicking on random things. Um, so I would, I would just look, okay, LaDonna's saying Lucite does glow under a black light. So there's something in it that makes it glow. So that's a good thing to know. So going um, back to the record, I, I test it, but I multitask. So I let it run. I let it, I'll listen to it while I'm doing other stuff too. And I gravitate more to the 80s music because that's my genre that I love. So, so you I like don't it? Mind, <laughs> yeah, so I don't mind listening to the music as I'm doing. I music. just listed a record player today on eBay, actually. Um, but I don't I don't typically sell. I have sold a few records, but I mean, mm -hmm. like maybe five in five years. The record um, collectors are really strong. So if they buy one from you and you have more, they're going to come back to you a lot because they, they're really Yeah. Good. Yeah. And I mean, if that's something that you do a lot of, I could see it. Like for me, I just like, and I mean, that's the same way with the watches though. Same reasoning, you know, like mm -hmm. it's not worth it to like test them when they're worth 20 bucks. Like, yeah. It's just like we just we got a goofy plush that's worth like 30 to 40 that I tested. But if it had been worth like 20, I would have been like untested. Like I'm not going to even take the time to put the batteries in because when you're paying people by the hour, like there goes all your profit. If it takes them 15 minutes to grab some batteries, put them in a toy, yeah. you just increased your costs by like five bucks. But I guess it's also because you do thousands of items. I'm only doing hundreds. so. Yeah, time to do that. Right? Yeah, we do a lot of bulk, but I mean, I and anybody who watches me for a long time knows, like, I don't like we don't like iron or steam our clothes. Like, we lay them out exactly how they are. Um, mm -hmm. If they're horrible and worth a lot of money, I would. Um, yeah. But it's the same thing. If they're twenty, thirty bucks, we'll lay them and smooth them out. But we're not gonna, you know, iron them. Um, I had some hankies we ironed because the hankies were worth like 40 bucks and it's like a 12 inch square, you know? So like that stuff we did, but overall, um, I, I, Rod says pro profits, not projects. And that, that's about the same thing for me. Like I wouldn't like, I don't buy any shoes that I have to clean hats. I will buy We have like a giant, 
I haven't cleaned them. I have like a giant stack of hats that need to be cleaned, but um, I typically try and stay away from that stuff. The store 61 wants to know how financially successful is your YouTube channel? And do you think there is room for new reseller channels? Um, I do think it's a little saturated compared to when like Kevin, the Commonwealth pick girl or people like that uh, jumped into the game. It's more saturated now. So you have to actually just make yourself more unique. What do you do differently than what's out there already? Because the, there's so many videos, so many resellers on YouTube. You have to have something to make you stand out. Um, for me, I'm not even at a thousand subscribers yet, by the way. Um, but I, I think. So, so he's not financially making anything. Yeah. So I, I, I would say that, you know, I have to make sure that my, my, so my stuff is unique. You know, what's made me stand out from like Kevin and other people. I would have to agree with Matt for sure about uniqueness. And definitely, I think when it comes to saturation, honestly, I think there's a there's a huge gray area when it comes to, I mean, I'm young, but I realized this very, very soon is like when people overthink things, that is like the worst thing you can do. So like when it comes to like starting a channel and all that, I looked at it like this, like if you genuinely love reselling, like regardless of the fact of, oh, hey, I went to a thrift store and found a thousand bucks who cares about that i just like going to the thrift store and be like oh my god i found this item i don't even care about the price you know like and i just make a video about it so it's like when it comes to saturation if you just truly love reselling and making content it's really no point you know you have no worry about your competition like i'm gonna be honest like yeah you have commonwealth picker you have harry tornado and them all up there but if you just focus on your own path and not really kind of I don't want to say care about what other people upload, but really just focus on your own path and just honestly kind of what Mr. B says, you just get better at every single video and that's it. It's really all it is. I wanted to add to that too, because like, because, you know, if you're under a thousand, if you're not monetized yet, you have the luxury of tweaking it and testing it out and everything. Yeah, dude, upload anything. Yeah. 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 So mine is pretty i would say pretty successful my annual income on youtube is probably more than a lot of people make at their jobs um and it was down last year because the year before i had a viral video that like really bumped my income up and i didn't have any viral videos in 2023 but um I think there is room, but I also, and I'm going to say this because you asked how financially successful, I want to tell you, if you start YouTube to make money, you're going to be sorely disappointed. It is yep. less than 1% of channels that are making money. Uh, and You have to love it. I'm telling you, you can't just... You, you know, have to love it. People can tell. They can tell if you're genuine. You have yeah. to see like what you're doing that people like, like I do what sold my what sold do great, but other people can do what sold and people don't watch them. So they like their thrifting videos. I have separated my channels. My second channel is growing well. I'm happy with where it's at. We're almost at 9,000 subscribers over there. Um, but I will say that if you start it for money, you're going to be disappointed. And if you really do it right, you're going to be putting a lot of time and effort into it for free uh, yeah. for months, yep. for a long, long time. Um, I, and I, I've told this story before. I, for the first five months of my YouTube channel, spent 40 to 50 hours a week in chats and comments, getting my name out there. I did daily videos for a while and it was all for free. I earned absolutely nothing from that and now is it paying off yes i will also tell you froggy flip started at the same time as me i think he's close to four hundred thousand subs but i and i'm not going to name names i will tell you there are other people that started at the same time as me that are not monetized right now that have been putting out videos regularly the whole four years just like i have they're not making any money so it, there there's room and if you're unique it takes one video that's what blew my channel. it was one friggin video that blew my channel up um and most of the people that are bigger that i talk to same thing like one or two videos and like boom like you got it you never it could be your first video 
Sonny's hey, wife. Sunny Las Vegas wife first video got like 60,000 views or something. Well, remember LL Handmaid and Beyond, his first video he ever put out did 150,000 views. He's like, oh, just YouTube things would be super easy for him. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, and then yeah, I'll yeah. tell you, you try and recreate that viral, and that is not how it works. Have I you, have how many tried times that. Have you created your teacup video now? A lot. <laughs> just never. And it has not worked. Because um, timing is everything. That's the biggest thing people don't understand, too. And you know? it's weird. YouTube, like, links your channel with, like, I got linked with Home Talk channel somehow, which is a big channel. That's how my teacup video went crazy. But then I can tell you I've started doing research videos because that was a video that went viral. And that's what started me doing research videos. So that's why I said you got to see what you like doing. Like, I like doing my what sold, but I like doing research and whatever is hitting is what you should do more of and focus on getting better. Like my research videos, but now here lately, my what souls are getting the views too. So, I mean, I have those two things. I separated out my thrifting because it is a little bit different audience on thrifting. Rod has separated his two as well. Um, in the beginning, I said I would never do it. I'm just leaving it all on one <laughs> channel. And then I kind of ate my words and um, split it up. But yeah. So Rod, now that you're back, what what do you say to this? Well, first and foremost, I want to apologize, you guys. My AC has been acting up tonight. It's leaking water. And so my, yeah, so it's made, it just made a popping noise. That's why I had a quick run and go check on it. Now. <laughs> but I think I'm good for now. Um, so yeah, when it comes to, here's the thing. This is what I tell everyone. Everyone is unique in their own way. You know, you could be a boring Betty, but yet some people find that fascinating because they're very analytical. They just like that. You know, like if you ever watch Cam's videos, Cam is, he's like quick. He's the younger generation. Like that's your, how you come across to you do your videos, but he puts out a great product and a great video and stuff like that. And by the way, make sure you guys both subscribe to both these guys. Let's get Matt. Matt, how many, how many subs are you at, by the way? I have like 673. Let's get him over 700 tonight, guys. So give a decent amount of follow. That's the biggest thing is getting these small channels to grow. But I would say there's room for everyone. And just because there's a big pool of people doesn't mean you can't put out a channel. Like there's thousands, there's how many sports channels are out there about you know sports. There's millions of sports channels. Yet people come up with new ones every year and people grow in that, that category. Yeah. You just have to be unique. You have to find a way to that you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You're going to take stuff that you like from other people's videos and take stuff that you don't like, you're not going to do, but you have to find a way to put your twist on it that makes it unique to you. Be authentic because people can see through your BS and can see when you're faking it. And then, and, and just do you just keep doing what you're doing. That's the biggest thing. You know, that's why I was telling you just people, keep right? doing it. Most of yeah. the overnight sensations on YouTube, like I watch the motivational speakers, like they were making videos for like six years before they went viral. And now they have 10 million subs. Like yeah. you never know which video is going to go and crazy. This, this is what I would tell a lot of people. I, so everyone's like, I can't tell you how many YouTubers or smaller channels tell me, have reached out and told me, is like, I, I'm thinking about quitting. I've been doing this for two months. I'm not going to get away on it. I have people say, I've been doing this six months, doing this a year. I did not have, and I don't, I still haven't had a video. I had not had one video on my channel go over 100,000 views. I've had, had even had a video hit 75,000 of mine. Okay. I have 200 plus videos. My first video that hit like over 25,000 wasn't until I got to like 100 videos. So if I would have stopped at 99, I would never got the experience of getting my video to start taking off because you never know how close you are, guys. You guys could be the one video away from just popping off. And, and but you know, do it because you like it, not because you're hoping for that video. Correct. Right. And, and that's the because that thing. video might never come either. Right. Like, yes. and I don't want to be negative, but you have to like doing it. Like, I like making right. content. I've stepped away. Like, I didn't put out a video on my second channel for like four months. Sometimes you need a break if you get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Now I'm doing videos every day. One on this channel, then one on the thrifting channel, and I alternate. I'm doing daily videos again. Yeah. Because I really like, I like it. I like doing it. I want to do it. And if I get tired of it and feel like it's a chore again, I'll cut them back down again, you know, because people can tell if you're into it, if you're being authentic yeah. or if you're just doing it to do it. Correct. And yep. it takes a while to open up and be able to talk freely on camera like we're doing now. Like, go back and watch. Like, I haven't taken any <laughs> of my dang videos down. The first one's upright. It's not even the right direction. Like, go back and look at people's first YouTube videos. And that will get, like, that'll give you hope as far as 
Like you'll see, it takes time to develop. It takes, you know, it takes time to figure out your style, what you like. It's going to be a mesh. And I think almost everybody starts off copying somebody else. You'll be like, oh, they're watching Kevin or oh, they're watching Josh. Yeah. Like I started out watching Matt part-time pickers. I was holding my items up. I looked exactly like Matt did. I probably sounded exactly like Matt did. And now I do like the same thing. So I have, I just looked it up. I have 1170 videos. So I have almost 1200 videos on YouTube and it's, that's over four years. So it's definitely, it's consistency just like, like reselling is you have to be consistent, but you have to be doing it for the right reasons or people will know people can see through that. All right. We got a few super chats. Okay. What does Shane have to say? Volleyball practice for the stepdaughter tonight, dropping by to say hi, kill it, Matt and cam cam. What's your favorite soda city flips video? <laughs> He asked me that question again. <laughs> now he's putting you on the spot. Oh, that's hilarious. No, I don't have one, dude. I still haven't even looked. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. All that's right, we hilarious. got three. I'm gonna I'm gonna bulk Welcome. do a whale. Yeah, okay. Wolfman's good. He said a two dollar super chat. Thank you so much, Shane. Thank you. And Miss Susan sent four ninety nine and said thank you for the podcast. You are so welcome. Here's the whale. I I like the whale. The whale's one of my favorite now. Here you go. Kat, we were talking about our, like our first videos and how cringy they were. I always remember. I always talk about like. And th the point I'm making with this is that so many people in the chat I know that want to start a YouTube channel and just don't start it because they're afraid of what it's going to be. If you guys go back and watch my first video, go watch them. It's it's they're it's funny. so bad. My my stepson was ten or eleven at the time, and he's holding the camera trying to do it. And you thought my my cameraman had Parkinson's disease. It's shaking around. And he's trying <laughs> to get it. You know, like it's just like. But and my lighting's all horrible, and I'm standing there trying to hold up a comic book and show you what what I got from this box from CGC. But like. You know what, though, it, it, it literally having me do that was such a relief because I did it. I broke the ice. And that's the yeah. biggest thing I tell you guys. And I, my biggest regret, and, and, and Kat, you probably might, I don't know if you had the same regret, though, but you ever think about your biggest regret on YouTube? My biggest regret always is not starting sooner. Mine is having lipstick on my teeth tonight. Hold on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I never had that problem, so... Uh, you're you. lucky. Yeah. I will yeah. tell you guys too. I think mindset and manifesting is like a yeah. giant thing. Right. And yeah. my husband used to laugh. He he doesn't laugh at anything I tell him I'm doing anymore because I think I've proven to him over almost ten years that like if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. But like when I started out, like. I'm a YouTube star with a hundred subscribers. And he's like, you're ridiculous. And I'm like, Oh, 200 subscribers. And he's like shaking his head. I'm like, I'm YouTube famous. Like if you think that way and you act that way and you come across that way, see, look, Matt's already got 700 subscribers. Let's get him 800. Let's get him going. Like thank if you, you come you. across that way, then that's how you're going to be perceived. You know, like, fake it till you make it guys like that's all i can say i mean and that that was me and now he's just like okay like um same thing with like i started my new instagram for like for working out so i have like 300 subs i'm i'm like super excited about 300 subscribers i might have seventy thousand over here but that's a different account right like my my second channel has nine thousand. And I think don't take it for granted. Like I appreciate every single person who's following me, whether it's 300 or 77,000 and yeah, name it and claim it. Exactly. Like just. I was going to add like, um, I started off as being a car channel and I didn't show my face. I was just showing hands and just items. And then I, I was like, Hey, you know, I want to do reselling and I did it. And then I'm like, you know, I hate my voice. It's annoying. I still hate my voice to this day, but I'm like, Wow, I'm getting my creative side out. I'm putting myself out there. I'm getting in touch with my audience. I I, I think it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And so the answer that just go back to that, I know that question is how financially successful are we? 
So for those that don't know, my my second channel, Flipping and Punching, I got monetized February 3rd. I'm going to put out a video at the beginning of March, how much money I made my first month being monetized. So that a lot of the, the reason I'm doing this, yeah, the reason I'm doing this, so resellers, a lot of people in the reselling community can actually see how much money people actually make their first month. Is it worth it? How much time are you putting in? What are you making per hour? Because I think it's it's people need to know these things because a lot of people think like, you know, that cat's rich because she has 77,000 followers on it. I'm not we, rich. Wish, we wish that was the case. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, but I do could, make a good amount from yeah. YouTube, but I am far from being rich or even <laughs> like being able to take vacations whenever I want. I'm not at that point yet. Um, I, I, but lose I put money. in a lot of work. I put yeah. in like 40, yeah. 50 hours on the YouTube side of things. And to you know, make what I make, you you make more money than I do, Kat, on on YouTube, and because you have a bigger bigger audience than me. But at the same point in time, is like I think I, I can speak for both of us. We both lose money when we put out videos because that 40, 50 hours. If you reinvested that back into reselling, you yeah. make five yeah, times like what you're making because yeah. because you, you can list in one day. You save you list an extra thousand dollars for those eight hours you're putting in. You know what I mean on on eBay? Like that adds up over over a year. Like it's not even going to touch what what you're producing on, on social media accounts you know that's what people and it could drop like like i said between 2023 and 2022 i had a twenty thousand dollar drop in income on youtube that's how big of a like wow. it was a big drop um and so it's like a worse roller coaster than ebay if you get a viral the climb is absolutely amazing i will tell you but the part coming down is not much fun and then you're like well what am i doing wrong why can't i do it like it will get in your head i know like a lot of josh i don't know if you any of you guys watch him i know like he stopped it because like it's a mind game like we're watching what Oh, is it one of ten? I dropped two videos, ten of ten. Like it gets in your head. Like yeah, it it, what, what people don't understand is like when we put up these videos, YouTube gives you a ranking of your last ten videos. So when I drop a video and when it puts within the first hour, it says, "Oh, that video is a nine out of ten. That means that compared to my last ten videos I dropped, that's where it's at. Or if I come down and then you know, and then maybe two hour, three hours later, the algorithm picks it up and there's going to be a one out of ten, and you're on top of the world, but the most frustrating thing, and I, I can talk for everyone on this panel who, who does YouTube, is when you are consistently putting out good content over and over again, and just the algorithm's not pushing you, like yeah. people aren't watching your video, and then you just start questioning everything. Like, and it could be like the best video ever, and for whatever reason, YouTube doesn't push it, and then like you make a crappy one that you're like, I don't know if I should put this out, and, and then it goes like number one. Yeah. You're like, well. Yeah. But like Maybe. mentally, I, I think Kat hit the nail on the head. Like it is a mental game. You have to have a thick skin because dude, because you start questioning like, should I still be putting out? Because you know if you you have a fluctuation like I'm right now, I'm currently in a fluctuation of like last month. I had a couple of videos that went to like fifty, seventy thousand, and now I'm like I did. I was at like one hundred fifty thousand views for one month, and next month I'm down to like ninety thousand. Like what am I doing differently? I lost you know sixty thousand views within a month compared to a month and it'll go back up and it just switches back and forth but like and down, I'm, and I'm questioning and down. my thumbnails my titles my content what do i need to go film do i need to do something else like it is a mental drain on you and people just don't understand now i understand why people quit youtube when they're successful because <laughs> they just can't take the roller coaster i, I was going to add like youtube is an emotional roller coaster because like you can't help to compare your channel to another channel. You go, why is that person doing I better stopped. than I stopped. I stopped. I used to, and I don't like, I don't look at anybody anymore at all. Like I just, I quit because it will jack your head up so bad. Like, like I was saying, like I, I could be, I could either be like, Oh, I'm happy. Like I'm ahead of a lot of people I started with or I could be like, why is Anthony Froggy Flips got 400,000 and I'm, I ain't even hit 100,000 yet. It really did, like, who are you comparing yourself to? And most of the time, you're going to compare yourself to somebody that's doing better, right? You're not going to compare yourself to somebody that's not doing as good. And again, I won't say names. I had somebody that I was like neck and neck with. And and if, they're, if they watch this, they will know. And if they want to out themselves in the chat they can't but we were like this getting to a thousand like one of us will go up other one go up one of us go up other one go up um i have over seventy five thousand more subscribers than them now and like we were neck and neck for months 
Well, and I, then I, it just went crazy. I had this conversation with Cam because I met Cam at FlipCon. Um, you know, when when we were there and we we're talking, and like if you guys ever watch his his shorts are great. Like he puts out really good shorts, and he'll some of his shorts have gotten a hundred thousand views, got fifty thousand views. But when he puts it as long form, he was struggling. He's like, hey man, like, and I don't mean to call you out on when I'm saying this, but yeah. like we had this conversation. You, it's almost even with your own content, like you battle sometimes where one is you're like. I could put out great shorts and then get all these watchers and then people, it doesn't transcend over to, to long view. And then same thing for me. Like I put out good. It's long a different content. audience. It's a different mm-hmm. audience. And they, but that's also a mental battle. Cause you're like, man, like why don't pe- people just like me in short bursts? Why don't they like my long form content? People like, don't want to watch me for more than a minute. I can't like, only talk for more yeah. than, uh, for less than a minute. Like that's why yeah. I don't have short form content. Cause I, I admit say, it. I, I actually like thrifter sifter shorts than his long yeah. form. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. like that. You know what I mean? Like that's, there's nothing against him. He puts out, he, he puts out quality shorts with what he does. You know, I would yeah. say uh, it's hard to like really put your time in areas. Like I've very much experienced, like I experimented like with doing more long form, doing more short form. And it's like, really now I'm stuck in a hole where it's like, okay, hmm, do I want to make short? Do I want to make long? Or <laughs> I want to go to the thrift store and find stuff. It's like, hmm, where am I? <laughs> right. You it's know? true. Though. It's a constant battle. And it changes. Because like, it's it's cause, cause like one it's month or to... one week, I could go crazy with editing. But then it's like, oh, my eBay check's going to be shit. You know? Yeah. And it's, all right, well, what do I do? You know? So I just kind of balance it out, do what I can do, and then just don't stress about it. Yeah. Is it safe to say that for long to- uh, long form videos, if you get 30% of your subscribers and views, that you're doing okay? Yeah, I'll tell you, like, I'm not even getting 10% right now. Like, I'm getting 10 to 15. Yeah. But here's the crazy thing. On my second channel, I get more than 100%. I get more views than I have subs on my second channel. So, like, it's, but, like, when I was, it, it's it's so hard. But, like, I would say now I get, like, 15%. Mine's really low on this channel. So, all right, we yep. got three super chats again. Yep. Mark. Rocks to be me said, I really appreciate revising all the videos. Though content is priceless. Thank you all. You are very welcome. And then Cage Gambit said, thanks for all the great information that helped start my eBay business earlier this month. Awesome. You are nice. welcome. Congrats. And what am I doing? Um, <laughs> Dalton. That like sums up my kid in 20 seconds. <laughs> it's so funny. The The teacher came like running out to the truck this morning when we dropped him off. And she's like, he is reading so good. She said she wanted to move him up, but there weren't like spots, I guess, in the advanced thing. And the funny thing is he's a little pain in my butt. Cause like, if he doesn't want to read, that boy is not reading. Like, but he's smart. Like he's smart as crap. But if he doesn't want to do it, so like they have the reading log. Like I quit filling it out because he won't. Like he's like, nope. But he knows how. He just like if he don't want to do it. Oh, that's awesome, Liz! Congrats, sale five hundred today. Awesome. That's amazing. Oops, oops. What, what am I doing? Uh, I have no. Clue. I'm not touching anything. All right. <laughs> All right. What's the weirdest thing each of us has sold? Oh man. Ooh. Oh boy. Um, I sold a teeth model that I bought from a. Uh, old dentist store. Someone bought it for me. Sorry, my bad. My phone is dying. But uh, weirdest thing. Oh yeah, Streamyard will kill it fast. Yeah, yeah weirdest thing I sold. That's crazy. I bought a motorcycle jacket from a yard sale, and I was showing my dad. I was like, "Yo, look how cool this is." I bought it for like ten bucks, right? Anyways, he, my dad was like, "All right, I'm gonna put it on." He puts it on, puts it in his pockets. Pulls out a little pack of, I don't know if you guys know what this is, but I was, I was learning. It's <laughs> called Chicklets gum. Chicklets? Yep. Yeah. I remember like those. It, it was, is a green, it was sealed, sealed little box. Probably had like, I don't know, one piece of gum in it. I swear. I sold it overseas or something like that. International program for like, the guy was all in like $50 after shipping. Like a little, little box. Was it, of gum. was it vintage, vintage gum? Yeah, piece? from the nineties. Little yeah. box of green gum. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Rachel uh, Strickland actually sold some pieces of gum too that she found also like in a in a piece of clothing or something like that before. 
Oh, I think his, his phone, phone died. died. Yeah. His phone died. Uh, Lisa got the answer to the question. People right? tape, too. Yeah. Bubble What's tape that? sells well. Bubble tape. So if you guys go on YouTube, you t- there's videos. P- uh, maybe the auction professor has one and stuff like that, but weird stuff that sells. Like, So I've sold, like, expired um, – Ex, like old like food that was like canceled before I, i've sold stuff like that that's been canceled discontinued uh old soda i've sold that in the past um I'm trying to think what else i've sold that was really weird i sold a deep so when the let me let me say this with a disclaimer okay i wasn't trying to profit off people that were in a time of need but when the when the hurricanes hit punta gorda were you smelling years, toilet paper no no when, when the hurricane <laughs> came my we actually my my roommate at the time was actually from Punta Gorda. So they went down there and they filmed. This is back in like what 2004, 2006, something like that. They filmed it for like an hour. They with a camera going around. I burned it to a DVD and I was like, I figured a lot of people want to see this. And so I put it on eBay. So I sold DVDs of the destruction of Punta Gorda down there. And I would get so many, I would get heat mail that say, No, you're trying to profit out of the now the money went to part of his family, part of the money went to his family and stuff like that. But the reason I did it was because there are a lot of people in Florida that used to live there or want, or have family there wanted to actually see what the area looked like and stuff like that. So, so many oh. people reached out and thanked me for that. So, I wasn't doing it bad. I wasn't trying to like profit that, but that, that was a weird thing to sell. I don't, I haven't, I don't feel like I've sold really weird stuff. I sold taxidermy. I think taxidermy is weird, oh. but the laws are horrible. So I would never recommend yeah. anybody else sell taxidermy. I know what I sold. I sold a baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire that was actually had had blood on it. Um, it was actually used in a pro wrestling match. That sounds illegal. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that was back yeah, was back in the back in the early two thousand days. But yeah, it was taken from a pro wrestling match, and I sold it on eBay. All right. What handling times? Um, Berkshire Picker says I use same day. What do we use? I do one day handling only for the fact that the post office, I have a UPS store two blocks away from me in the city, and they take USPS as well. So I could drop all my packages in one shot. It takes me five minutes to get there by walking. So I don't mind doing it. So I have. Two days or three days on mine, just the fact that I'm a one man show. I'm editing my videos, I'm selling things, I'm doing whatnots, I'm doing all this stuff. So I like, I try to get myself out the next day, or I do, I do ship stuff sometimes the same day if I'm pulling orders that day. Um, but I don't ship out every day, just the fact that I, I'm pulled in multiple directions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <I made it laughs> <back>. <laughs> um, but Kim, what about you? What's your, what, what is your handling times? Do you ship same day? What do, um, two days. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay. So you ship yeah. those? And I do next day. I don't do same day. I do next day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had to, where did this just go? I don't think I started. Where did it just go? So for those oh. that do ship same day, let you know, you can actually set a cutoff time too. So like if it's, you can put noon as your cutoff time. So they order if before they 10 a.m. Yeah. or whatever yeah. early. Whatever you want to do. Russell wants to know if any of us Florida people are going to the Savannah Bananas game this weekend. I put this up here. So I have I have a daughter who is 22 and um she she is going to the game. She is going this weekend. Oh. So that's why I put that up. Kim, you going? What is I've never heard of it. Yeah, you you know should it? look it up. Just look right, so it up. Picture, Savannah, do, you know like, the, do you know the Harm Glow Charles are? Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to go. Oh, yeah, so picture yeah. the Harm Glow Charge, but as a baseball team, pretty much the same, oh, same concept. Okay, same okay, concept. Okay. But they came to Tampa, and I tried to get tickets. You had to go enter. They're so popular when they travel. You have to enter in a lottery to get them. Right. And I tried to enter in a lottery for all days. I didn't get them. So, wow. So that yeah. actually pretty big, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure my daughter's going. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Debbie wants to know, what is the cheapest way to ship jewelry? Um, the little jewelry that I do do is um, I do like a four by six padded envelope wrapped in other padded envelope um, bubble wrap, and it, it goes ground advantage for me. I don't do jewelry, but if I had to, I would just yeah wrap it in bubble wrap and put it in a poly bag or a box, depending on how much like it is. I don't know. So yeah. if it's under like 
50 pounds. I mean, 50 pounds. If it's under $50. That's a lot of jewelry, <laughs> yeah, that's right? Wow. jewelry right? Mr. That's, T. Hey, listen, I'm just, bo- I'm bulk selling stuff over here now. Uh, if it's under 50 bucks, I'm going to just put in a, wrap it up in bubble wrap and put in either padded envelope. Or, but yeah. if it's, if it's something more expensive or something that could get damaged in shipping, I use a little like four by six box, a little square yeah. box and I'll put, I'll ship in that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we put everything in a jewelry box and then in a padded mailer. If it's under $50, if it's over $50, it goes in a box. It goes in a jewelry box inside of a box. Yep. Typically. Um, Selling vintage costume jewelry, eBay or Poshmark? Um, I don't know about costume jewelry. I just do eBay, but I, I don't have any history with Poshmark or jewelry. If you could do both, do both. I don't do it, but yeah, if you could do both, why not? So the more, the, the more views, the more people that see it, it's just more traffic. So for me, if I had costume jewelry, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sell it on eBay or Poshmark. I'm gonna put it on whatnot and sell it in a big bulk, and it's been selling good. I've been watching a lot of stuff on there. If it's sell. not name, yeah, if it's, yeah, not, if name. it's not name. If it, I, well, first, first off, let me rephrase. I will call. I will pick up the phone and call Cat first. Cat, <laughs> what do I do with this? And Cat be like, "Is it named? No." Put on whatnot. Some named goes on whatnot. Some named goes on whatnot. Um, so I sell all of my listings are on eBay, Poshmark, Mercari. We list on all three platforms with List Perfectly, and I sell way more jewelry on eBay than I do on Poshmark. But I do not recommend putting unsigned jewelry. You can. It's going to take a very, very long time to sell. You better keyword it right. You better describe it very well or it's going to sit there for years and years. Carrie's saying jewelry on Etsy. That was not my experience. Um, I did not do well with my jewelry on Etsy. We actually stopped selling on Etsy, um, but I know a lot of people do. It's really weird. We were we were talking about this in my live shipping yesterday. It's weird how some people can sell some things. Like I can tell you, oh, I'm selling my license plates all day long. You go buy a bunch of license plates and you can't sell them. You know, like handkerchiefs. I sell a ton of handkerchiefs. Same thing. People buy them. They can't sell them. It like I watched like the tie guy and thought I could go sell ties. I was completely wrong. I cannot sell a tie to save my life. So like it's it's either like the words you're describing them with, you know, how you're photographing them. But um, the experience is really, really different for everybody on each platform. So like we could tell you, but you could go out and you could have a ton of sales on Posh uh, and where I'm not like, I do sell some jewelry on Posh, but I the majority really goes more on uh, eBay. Lori said, I've had two packages, both under 36 square inches, ground advantage, eBay label printed out a cubic weight instead of pounds. One was two pounds, one was three pounds. Has anybody else noticed this? I don't notice this. Um, usually I use Shippo and Shippo does it correctly with, with my mailing. Um, For that question, yeah. I, I honestly only really ship in a bag or like a shoebox and that's it. I don't really touch cubic rate unless it's like, no, nah, I don't even touch cubic rate. That's just me. But, so I, I know the post office did change with eBay with, you know, the, they're doing the cubic now for a different things. So I think it automatically just does it for you do you know cat i think it's doing whatever's cheaper is what's going on Mm. so that's where like i've noticed like box size is mattering and i used to say like if it's under 12 by 12 by 12 it doesn't matter i've noticed that it does now Mm. like if it's like eight by six by four compared to 12 by 12 Mm. it could be cheaper so i think we need to be like a little more consistent on putting like the actual measurements where we used to not have to but now like and it's crazy and i thought about about talking about this in a video too like ebay's default on a lot of stuff i've been listing they've been having like 25 by 12 by 3 which makes it over the length and if you don't pay attention your shipping is going to be like so jacked up have you noticed that they're like defaulting to a 25 inch measurement it's weird. It's, it's like crazy. 25 or 18. I had that default too, like a while ago. Do it to make more. Yeah. But, you know, now I'm thinking about this cat. I think eBay adapted what pirate ship was doing for the longest time where, you know, eBay so antiquated where it takes you so put long it in to... and then it's going to find that lower yeah, rate. So I think they added the, the cubic because that's why a lot of people would input 
import their uh, their listings over to pirate ship because it was actually cheaper to ship cubic rate on on pirate yeah. ship for the longest time and now i think ebay has that feature added in there it's just something that they're just you know they're always a, a day late and a dollar short when it comes to you know being up to date on on whatever else is doing unfortunately yeah yeah for sure Picker gems. This is about the same as Poshmark or Mercari. Better to sell clothes. It depends on the clothes. Like it yeah. really depends on what I. I th- Cameron, do you do you sell on Posh and Mercari or where? So I personally, so I truly don't like use another platform to like cross list and stuff. But I don't list on Mercari just because like I don't want to put my eggs into that basket. So I really just only do eBay primarily for everything. And then when I dip into Poshmark, I only do shoes on Poshmark. Only okay. because of like, I, I obviously still live at home and I don't want to take up too much space of my parents' place. So I want to try to move shoes as fast as I can because they're just, they take up more space than clothing. So I just only cross list shoes. And honestly, I will say this, it's worth it because I kind of look at Poshmark as like a separate savings because it's a bank. Like when you sell something on Poshmark, you don't even have to take out the money. Like you could just hold it in there until it reaches like, if you want a thousand bucks in there on sales, you can hold it into, into ew, in there until a thousand dollars. And then you can yeah. just pull it out whenever. So, so for, for disclaimer here, if you guys ever see his sell through rate, that's what really caught my eye when I first met him. The sell through rate was like 80 to like a hundred percent of everything that you list. Like it's crazy. Like, so, and I would always say, like, I like watching you and Artariso because you. I always say you guys are the next generation of pickers coming up, the younger generation, that you guys find stuff at the thrift store that I wouldn't normally look for, you know, like new brands, stuff like that, because you're more in the streetwear, you're more into, yeah. you know, and younger generation, what, what what is fashionable for those guys, which is always good. That's part of the reason why I wanted you to come on here with that. I um, will say with the sell-through rates, so like I said, I have my own store, and yeah. I think my sell-through rate right now is like, they have like 810 listings but i have like 740 sold so it's like, yeah. like so almost 100 percent. Yeah, and my average value like per item i think is like i think i want to say it's like 38 dollars or 40 it's like one of those so like, it's moving fast right now i started my like my parents own ebay account on the side just like so i can like pay rent in a way to them so i just like mm-hmm basically whatever they find i sell for them and i teach them how to do it as well and their sell through rate because i run it like i just sign in their account on my phone their sell through rate right now is like 170 i think to like 190 so that's 100 wow. yeah. and but it's a, yeah. it's a smaller store i don't know what the average cost like on each item is but that's how the rate's doing immaculate and just for everybody watching it's really just if I had to break it down in simple, whatever you're going to buy at a thrift store or wherever, just look up exactly what you're going to buy before you even buy it. So there's no yeah. reason you're buying an item that doesn't sell. If you're buying an item that doesn't sell, it's your wrongdoing of doing the wrong research. That, that's Don't all. Don't tell is. them that. That's mean. <laughs> that's a comment I got on my video when but, I said the same thing. But, but it will. It will. But, it will. I, no, I agree. That's what yeah. I said too. I, I think he make he make a really good point on this because you know when you come to selling clothes of that, people find those outliers all the time where they're like, oh man, this one sold for fifty bucks, but there's a hundred listed and there's only ten sold, and then yeah. one sold, and like, oh man, I, yeah. they, they have five bucks on but the But the rest sold for twenty. Yeah, yeah, and, but then also too, what people don't understand is like, you know, if you guys understand how that cycle works, that means like, if there's twenty sold and there's a hundred listed, that means that five. every ninety days. Every 90 days is going to take 20 more of those. So that means yep. that's go through five cycles of 90 days, five yep. cycles. That's a year and a half before your, your item may sell that one item. This is why sell through rate is so important. Why we stress it so much on here. Yep. And like clothes are easy to look. Yeah. So I want to say that because like if you do vintage and antique stuff, you can't that's, find yeah. those comps. So like, and with me, it's buying lots, like that stack of vintage shirts up there. Like I bought 120 from her, you know, like I didn't, like, I'm not looking up comps, but I paid a great price for them. So I'm okay with that. And I have three sheds and a house for storage. I have warehouse space basically, you know, so like we can wait because we buy the lots and get stuff cheap. So 
I like our sell through rates only like 16%. It was down to 11 last year. It was wow. bad. Um, so I'm happy with 16. I'd like to get it higher. But if you want to make sure you're selling stuff like Cam's right, make sure you're picking up stuff you can comp. And yep. it sucks because you might like that vintage exactly. stuff, but you don't know how long it's going to take to sell. So if you don't have room and you care if it sells fast, then that stuff you probably should leave if you don't know it. So I'm curious, Cam, when it comes to your, your when you're, I mean, you said you live your parents' house, so you don't have a lot of storage, you know, with, with what you're working with here. So do you have a percentage like, are you doing like, like I always say like an 80, 20 rule where you want 80% of your stuff to have like a hundred percent sell through rate. And then you'll maybe have like 10 or 20% of items that are going to, you know, that they're vintage or, you know, they're, they're oh, higher dollar items or. Okay. So I go with, stuff? I go with, I try to make like, I used to go with a margin of 40% per item, like profit. I'll make 40% per item, no matter what. So like, even if I bought something for two bucks, if it's going to sell, a hundred percent sell through rate or more for over ten bucks. I'm all in. Like I already know it's gonna sell in, in yeah. thirty days or I already know days. You know, so it's just really like I said. It, it's people really get so broken down about the sell through rate, but it's truly just looking up exactly what you're gonna purchase. And it sounds so cliche. It sounds so dumb to really like just say that but even with clothing like this specific shirt right here you can find oh, make sure shirt. the size too like yeah, check the too. sizes yeah because you could find something that is a large and then it sells like crack but then all of a sudden when you find it in a small it's horrible so you just yeah. look up exactly what you're going to buy and that's it yeah. it's plain and simple but you make a good point. Like it sounds so cliche, but the basics is like, is when you, when you break down, like when you peel everything back and you get to just the nuts and bolts of it, this is what makes a successful reseller compared to people that are struggling through that process where focus on sell through rate, you know, be smart with your buy. Some of the best buys people make are when you don't make the actual buy, don't mm -hmm. buy because you have to buy, you know, it's okay to walk away. And that's something I had to learn even to this day, which is difficult. Right. But you can be successful with, like, I just told you I have a 15% sell-through rate. Yeah, We're right. selling $200,000 a year. Yeah. You know, like, you can be successful without having it. But you can, like, Cam could make just as much money as I am with, a, like, 10% of the space because he's only buying high sell-through rate. It's so if you have possible. smaller smaller right. space, like, you got to find what works for you. If you have room, you buy lots. Like I built my business up on dollar box lots. Nobody else wanted. Of course, it's long tail stuff, but that's how I built up my business, built up my inventory. And I, I have the space. I have the space. I'm okay with it. If you're sitting in an apartment or you've only got a garage, a garage is not much space. Like we have like 2,500 square feet or more of inventory space that we use. So like, that's, that's where you got to be careful watching people to like, not try and sell like they're selling. If you don't have the same situation, if you don't have that storage space, yeah. you can't go and just buy big lots of stuff where half of it's going to take a year to sell. I make my money back fast. Now, don't get me wrong. I have my money back fast. But half of that stuff sits for a long time. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, at some point, a certain point, Kat, you're going to get, I mean, even though your sell through rate, say 15, 16% right now, at, at one point in time, you're going to have to make a decision where either, either A, you stop buying lots because you have so much, you know, inventory. Or but more just, selling. Like we have plenty selling. of room. That's the yeah. thing is like, stuff selling even if it's only that 15 percent yeah like i i slow down or i'll buy smaller stuff like i could buy scarves that don't take up a ton of space or like the harley pins 600 pins fit wow. on like a one oh, foot shelf me. i know all about the pin game all right <laughs> yeah that's what i'm saying like you could yeah. buy pins so yeah. i mean i could switch no, out buying lots yeah. and buy smaller stuff um if i needed to but like, I, I feel a lot, I, I'll tell you now with the thrifting channel, a lot more of my stuff is coming from thrifting than online auctions right now because I am doing a video every other day. And uh, the sell-through rate, then I'm checking it more. And it is like that stuff selling faster. But you got to figure I have 5,000 things that I bought when I was buying lots. Um, 
And I'm still learning. And the sucky thing for me, like I look up and see sell through rate and I'm okay with like a 50% sell through rate for me personally, but I don't have signal in probably 80% of the thrift stores I walk in Uh, and I've got a camera, I'm picking up stuff and I'm just like, and I'm learning and I'll learn and I'll keep learning. But yeah, like probably 80% of the stores around here, there is no signal. So you are not looking up anything, which sucks. I think another factor is if you're a full-time or a part-time reseller, like if you're a part-time reseller, do you need that extra income to, for your cost of living? Or can you, if you have the luxury to sit on items more because you you don't really need that income. So I think that has, uh, has to be in the equation as well. Yeah. I mean, like for me, I wouldn't, the only long tail that I'll buy that I'll put money out is stuff that I'm making like two, three, four hundred dollars or more. Like I made twenty five hundred dollars on a painting that I knew would be long tail like that stuff. I'm OK. Like, yeah, I sold two purses for six thousand dollars. Like I paid eight hundred bucks a piece, um, but they actually sold a month and a half. They sold fast. Um, but like the higher dollar, I'm OK it's like an investment, you know, like I know it's going to sell. It's just a matter of like, when is it going to sell? That's the thing. Yep. Yep. Terry wants to know, is it difficult to set up an account to ship internationally? Are you referring to eBay eBay or just like on your own, like shipping? I think she means eBay. You just turn it on. Yeah. Yeah. That's all you do. The button is it's, and then pirate ship. You, um, you can just do it. And then what's the the simple export rate? You just message them and ask them to turn it on on Pirate Ship. Kevin has arrived. <laughs> um, so if you're selling on Poshmark, what do you say is the best way to make a sale on Posh? I would like to know uh, myself. <laughs> I mean, I saw the little that I did sell on Poshmark. I mean, I mean, it comes down to the the fundamentals, right? You have to have good pictures because it's mostly catered to clothing. You got to do all the measurements because you know they're gonna ask you about the measurements. Um, you just have to you just have to do what you normally do, like eBay. The more information you give, the better. Uh, Cam probably could speak better about it than I can. I personally uh, do shoes only on my Poshmark store, but yeah, pictures are very important. Just to kind of make sure, like. You're better than other people, you know, make a good picture, make, make a good impression. And then make sure like all your characteristics in Poshmark are like filled out. Same for eBay, you know, just kind of make sure like you're following the rules on application, you know, and on my Poshmark, I really just, like I said, I do my shoes only. And I do know there's ways that people delist stuff on Poshmark to relist it and all that. But I personally just list it and then let it go. And then if I get a sale, like I said, Poshmark's like a little savings account. I don't really even, I just leave it there. And if it sells, it sells, you know? Yeah. And then for me, yeah. I would say for me, the biggest thing when I do sell stuff on Posh, it's, you know, consistently getting things listed on there, but, you know, sharing my store throughout the day. Yeah. And Cat uh, has a better plan, though, about getting offers out and getting <laughs> offers out. So, you know, all that Cat picked yeah, up. Yeah. I use one shop, one shop like shares a closet throughout the day. I have auto offers set up. So if you don't want to pay for a service, I'd say send offers to all your likers. Um, I do 20% typically off on posh and then it delists and relists sale listing. We don't get a ton. I'm on, hold on. I'll tell you I'm on posh now. Um, we sold $1,500 on posh this month. So it's not, not horrible. Um, but it's, like, extra. it's extra views and extra eyes. Like that's how right. I look. And that yeah. that's how I look at Posh and Mercari. Um, because like eBay is by far our main. So yeah. I don't let me see what we've done on Mercari. So Mercari's only at 617. It's funny, the last time I did my video, Mercari was above Posh. So they kind of flip-flop. Um, neither one though is consistent enough that I would rely on them. For our main income, but eBay is for us. Okay, Lisa said she currently has items listed on Mercari and Posh. She's not cross posting. She's saying she couldn't trust Vindu to take sold items down. So, how do I start with LP 
take all the cross postings down and leave eBay alone. So what I would do if I were in this situation, you need to delist everything on Poshmark. You need to delist everything on Mercari. Then you would take everything from eBay, put it into list perfectly, and then cross post it out. And they do have their auto delister. And then everything would be synced on list perfectly to where their auto delister would work. I, <clears throat> I do not use the auto delister um, for multiple reasons. I make my husband <laughs> in the listings every morning, but um, I, that's what I would do is I would totally take down Posh and Mercari, delete everything, start fresh so that everything is synced up through LP. You could go through each of your listings and add the numbers to it on LP, but that would take a, a lot longer, I think. All right, let me give Lisa the pillow fight. Here you go. I was trying to see if she said anything else. Where? Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, Caroline's saying she's using the delister on List Perfectly and it's working great. So that's good awesome. to know. I, I am not, again, I'm not using it myself. Question for Cam. What What is the item you like to sell the most? Most. So if I want to go basic and just say one genre, obviously clothing, because it dates back to where like, I think like three years ago, I found a polo jacket at Goodwill just randomly for like seven bucks. And I sold it for like 1200 in like uh, oh. two days. Uh, Kat, you might know it. Um, you know the Snow Beach polo Ralph Lauren? I think there's a lot of Ralph Lauren that's hot. Like Ralph Lauren sheets sell for yeah. like five, six hundred dollars. If I had to say like my favorite thing actually would be Polo Ralph Lauren because of me finding that piece. Like that <laughs> because of that one. one. Yeah. Have yeah. you I, I know you have searched for it ever since then. Have you come across anything similar to that ever since then? <sighs> similar to Polo Ralph Lauren. No, I mean um, similar to that big item, like that twelve hundred that that big whale out there. A big whale item besides like clothing. If I find some random stuff, it'd be like a I found a scream mask, like a Halloween mask, like the first yeah, gen. Those first gen, too. second gen? Uh first gen. I got it for free at a yard sale. Wow. I just, would, you, would you sell I that bought, for fifteen hundred? I, I bought some shoes at the yard sale and asked the lady, I was like, Hey, can I have that mask for free? And she said, Sure. I got it on camera too. And she <laughs> I, I went home and sold it for like uh like nine hundred. No, actually yeah, yeah, nine hundred to a thousand. Yeah, nine hundred to a thousand. Yeah. Nice. If if it's during if it's during Halloween, so if those that don't know, there's multiple generations of the scream mask, the horror yeah. mask, and if you have a first or second generation, the early generations can bring big money, but big money. They usually go around like a thousand bucks, some of that ballpark. But around Halloween time, you get a premium anywhere from. I've seen them go from fifteen hundred to two grand too. I uh, the guy who bought it off of me, the mask. He actually had a YouTube channel, and all he uploaded was videos based on Scream Mask. I wow. swear. And he had like 20,000 subs, and every video he uploaded was just him talking about a Scream Mask. So it's like <laughs> a dedicated collector. But like wow. Rob was saying, you get collectors, they're just, they're going to pay whatever they want first. So for those that don't know, there's a website that's dedicated to just Scream Mask and actually shows all the different generations, what to look for. The yeah. different manufacturer marks on them. I think it's from like the UK. I'll see if I can find it. I'll put it in the chat. But yeah. some are different colors too. Yeah, yeah. There's different colors ones. Yep. Yeah. 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 I know. I think I did like a Halloween one and there were a couple of them in there. Um and then there's like paper mache masks too. Watch for those. They're like yeah. old Germany paper mache. And they look cheap, but they sell really, really good, too. It's crazy. Some of the Halloween masks are absolutely insane. Yeah. Horror. Horror in general. Yeah. Like, yeah. Books, movies. Yeah. Yeah. All of that stuff. 
Terry wants to know what if you don't have a way to check Wii games. So I guess we could say all over about video games. Like, what do you do? Do you buy them if you can't test them? Or how do you do that? I buy them anyway. I just make sure there's no scratches on it. But I clearly say it's not tested if, if I didn't have a Wii with me. Yeah. I played games my whole life growing up. So I definitely, like, I'm not going to lie. When you see a game... You kind of know if it's gonna work or not, especially just by like the way it tells. So yep. like, like you you just kind of know. But majority of the time, like if I have the console game and if I have the console at home, I'll just put it in real quick, test it. But it's yeah. since it, since you don't have a Wii, it's, it looks like just really look for scratches, and that can really be a good tell. And not only on the the clear surface, but on the surface has the graphic. If that has scratches on it too, that can matter. Like sometimes it won't read because of that. A lot of people don't realize that the information is on top of the disc, and if you get scratched, you can actually damage it. So for me, believe it or not, I've I've sold thousands of games on eBay, and I don't test my games out when I do it. <laughs> Only times I would ever test them is when I put them through a disc cleaner to test them. The, I put them through a disc cleaner if they're scratched. But if I pick up a disc and I look at it, and it looks like it has minor scratches or no scratches on it, I'm going to list it on eBay and sell it. And I can tell, I can probably count on one hand how many returns I've had by doing that because time is money. I'm not going to waste my yeah. the, the probability if you you know I go by rule of averages. The probability of that disc not working is going to be highly in my favor of, of it working. So I'm just going to sell it as is, stuff like that. And if you hit with a return every once in a while. It's part of the business. But I will say is a, a little tip I'll give you guys. So like PS4, PS5, Xbox One, you know those games use Blu-ray discs. If you have a Blu-ray disc. Mm -hmm. Let me grab a CD here so I can quick show you guys. If you take a Blu-ray disc and you hold up to the light, if you can see light particles going through that, that's a damaged disc. So if because nice. you're not you're not supposed to be able to see directly through that. So if you hold up a, a CD, not a, not a CD, but it has to be a Blu-ray. If you hold Blu-ray and you can see white particles, you can see through it. You're not supposed to be able to see through it. That disc has some type of damage to it. So you might want to be careful. That might be a disc you want to test out before you actually sell it. Wow. Yeah, and I do the same thing as Rod. I figure most likely most of them are going to work. I just sell them, and if I get a return, I'll just refund them. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, Can you upload a WhatNot stream to YouTube? Yes, you can link WhatNot in YouTube. It's called Multicast uh, and Facebook. Uh, I have stopped unless it's, like, really, really good stuff. I don't simulcast all my shows anymore. Um, I just figure most people don't want to see them. So, yeah. Rod, you're still not simulcasting, right? What just happened? What? We lost Rob. Yeah. Rod, <laughs> what is going on? You don't know. I don't think Rod's simulcasting his, just FYI. Sorry, my I some I lost all sound for one second there. <laughs> We're what, like <laughs> what yeah, I was looking you, down you like, what is going on? Simulcasting, are you? No, You're I, have, I have not once streamed my whatnot to my YouTube channels or either my YouTube channels. I probably should, but I, I haven't. This is a million dollar question because I think if any of us knew the answer, we would be doing mm -hmm. the same thing they're doing. But um, Chance is saying, what do you think resellers that have successful videos are doing that people like so much? Uh, I would say they just like to relate to the person maybe, or, you know, they, they see you genuine, like Rod said. I mean, they could see it well, firsthand if, you, if you're fake or not. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you have to have some kind of charisma. I mean, little bits and pieces of little things uh, they all add up, I guess, uh, to each their own, I guess. Yeah, if I had to agree, I have to agree too. Be, be yourself when it comes to, you know, being successful on like your own video and your own like journey. And if I had to say maybe something that's like good for the reselling thing is when you're making videos on like whatever you're going to find, at least like show comps, you know, because I know some people like, like I would watch some like reselling videos and like I will watch. 15 minutes on my lunch break and next thing you know i'm five minutes into a video and i haven't seen a comp you know for so me i don't do comps on my thrifting ones because people complained cam people complained, they complained really? when i was put i'll throw like once in a while and i mean i have my what solds here at mm -hmm. the end i'll tell them what i think stuff will sell for 
but when I first started my thrifting channel, I was putting up comps for like everything and people hated it. They hated There's it. There's also a it, debate going it on where for everybody. There's wow. also a debate going on where people put comps during the middle of the video and some yeah. that do at the end of the video and then they go back and forth which way they like it. Yeah. I'll it's tell them way. at the end during the haul, but I don't put yeah. up comps. I tell them what I think it'll sell for. And I think a dangerous thing too is throwing up listed comps, not sold oh. comps. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it should be sold comps if you're showing any. Yeah. I, I would say I agree with Cam. I prefer when people show the comps in the screen because it, it you know, doing that. But uh, they, they answered the question here about, I think the biggest, I would tell you the biggest thing, well, a couple of things that make these successful YouTubers. One is great thumbnails, great titles. They get, they get your curiosity. You know, that's the biggest thing is, you know, they get you hooked. And in the first, you know, 10, 15 seconds, you're hooked into that video. That's a big thing. A lot, a lot of really good, successful YouTubers do. But the biggest thing, the biggest thing that lacks in our community, and this goes not just our community, across the board, and I come from pro wrestling industry where it's all about storytelling, is mm -hmm. people don't tell stories in their video. They just think, hey, this what's Some sold. people this what's tell sold. This too what's many sold. stories. You know, yes, <laughs> I'm a little picker. But <laughs> it, it, much as I hate him so much, you know, <laughs> Kevin does a great job of, of being able to tell a story. <laughs> and not just and, and not just on his flipper channel, but also even on his picker channel. Like, yeah. There's a way for you guys to go out and find items and tell a story as you're finding those items or to, you know, you know, drop hints about what's coming up in that video to tease stuff throughout the way. Like you want to get people not only to watch your video, but once they're there, you have to get something to keep them there. And that's the biggest things. A lot of people that aren't successful on YouTube don't find ways to keep people watching. The video. Cam does a great job with his videos. I, I would give you a lot of credit, man, with your style, what you do too. But. Thank you. Thank you. And I think everybody has different stuff. I would agree. Yeah. Kevin's a hundred percent is storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and other people, <laughs> other yeah. people. Your tornado it, that too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Josh, Josh does as well. Like you have to hook people, whether it's the storytelling, mm -hmm. whether it's suspense without doing the whole, like, what's it called? Why can't I think of it? Well, being clickbaity. Yeah, yeah clickbait. Yeah. I couldn't think of clickbait. Yeah. Um, I will but... say that having quote unquote characters in videos matters. And of course. it sound it doesn't sound right like saying it, but if you were to compare like Kevin's video, Commonwealth Picker, example, he goes to a garage sale. That person who's like having a garage sale, that's a character. Like that's a that's a right. new character in the right. video. So like, if you have like three different people at the yard sale running three different tables, boom, you got three different characters. And like, some viewer is probably gonna relate to Bob, Billy, that guy over there. You know, like like it just having characters, I would say, is pretty. Well, cool. it's and you make a good point because it's peeling back the onion. You're just not you're not one dimensional. When you have yeah. different characters, it adds another element. That's why they. That's why people shows. with couples a lot of times yes. tend yes. to do Correct. better. Yeah. Because yeah. there's multiple, then you got like a woman and a man that people can relate yeah. to, and and like like people like seeing Dalton in my videos. Like my mom used to yeah. come thrifting with me. Like people like seeing different people in the videos. And my and my video tonight is going to have a lot of characters. I'll tell you guys when we're signing out. I just scheduled it to come out at ten when we end oh, on nice. my second channel. Ha ha ha. <laughs> But that's like I, I have my dad in my videos. And I nicknamed him. My dad has the same name as me. We're both named Rod, but I call him Papa Punchin because yeah. not only do I give him a he's I give him a character name as well because people will remember. And when I go places, people are like, "Hey, it's, where's Papa Punchin at?" You know what I mean? Because yeah. they're looking for that that extra element to it. Or my last, I dropped a thrifting video this morning, which had my wife in it. I call her Mrs. Punchin. You know, in my videos just because. And then she does my whatnots with me when every time we hit a, a thousand new followers she'll do the giveaway show with me so i added the giveaway show then but then it's funny is all i do is get comments about her and nothing about me and they're like oh i want to <laughs> see where's your wife at where's your wife at you know like they love it though because it just adds a new element man it's like a good yeah like i like to use the example of the tv show seinfeld like you had jerry yeah. seinfeld which you either like him or hate him but what made that show is you know like kramer george elaine like all the newman all those characters around him added a whole new element to that show to put like you know Take yeah. it to the next level. And that's just, Kevin does a great job. I hate to say it. See, look, he's well, here. 
He's yeah. here. Oh, yeah, Papa Punchin's here. <laughs> for, for me, yeah. for me, I don't have that many garage sales in my area, so I have to do estate sales. So it's a little bit difficult to do that. So what I do is in my videos, I always tell the people what's going through my head when, as I'm picking. And I always relish when people have a conversation with me in the estate sale because yeah. I can't talk to the seller in the estate yeah, sale. So correct. I need some kind of communication going on. And yeah. also, yeah. My, my state is too nice. There's no drama going on. <laughs> if there was drama, you see me with more subs already. But Move to Florida, yeah. buddy. Move to Florida. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wild west down here. <laughs> The quirky squirrel said, what is your current favorite item to source? Mine is pens, but I sell everything in my store. I buy anything I like with the idea. If I like it, someone else will like it too. I will tell you that can be a very dangerous way to buy. Uh, for me, it's sports cards because I used to do a lot of breaking. Uh, if you're not familiar with breaking, um, you know, cases of cards are so expensive these days. So rather than buying a whole case to find those cards you want, people buy like a share or something. So it might be a team, it might be a player, it might be a serial number. So anything that gets hit on that spot that you purchase, you take all of it. So like, let's say I bought a, I'm in a baseball um, brand case of cards and I bought the Yankees for like $100. $100 is cheaper than buying a, a case that's a couple of thousand dollars. But the only caveat is if the case is broken, there's no Yankees, I'm out of $100. But if a Yankee yeah. hit, I, I take all the, reap all the rewards. Yeah. So um, going back to sports cards, I mean, I, I, I do it behind the scenes, behind YouTube, behind everything. I have a clientele that emails me, that tells me, hey, I'm looking for this, this, and this. So I have my own distributors to buy, I buy from, and I, and I sell it to them directly. So no fees are involved. I'm just doing it directly with them. So that is my bread and butter. The, the whole reselling thing, honestly, is more of a hobby. That's why I call myself a hobby reseller because most of my money on the side gig is from sports cards. Nice. Nice. My favorite item, obviously, is clothing, but getting more into it. Recently, I've been trying to find more, like, jerseys, just jerseys in general. Like, I found recent hockey jerseys, even just the basic soccer jerseys. You can find an Adidas jersey has the logo and it can be priced at like six bucks. You look it up, hundred dollar jersey just because it has some guy's name on it. I'm not gonna know who that guy is, but I'm gonna yeah. sell it. So yeah. So I'm gonna steal a page out of Cat's book on this one. All right. And I love, you know, I love selling the stuff that I enjoy. I enjoy to toys. I love video games. I love sports cards, comic books, stuff that I enjoy. I enjoy selling those things. But my favorite items to source are brand new items I don't know I have know nothing about because I get bored like Cat does a lot of times with just selling <laughs> the same stuff over and over again and I am a con I'm a human sponge I need to keep learning I yeah. just have to learn like it, yep. it's within me I'll do this the day I die and you know when I find new items like for example earlier this year I didn't sell anything Disney and I spent over I spent probably twenty thousand dollars on Disney items last year at the end of last year, and now I sell Disney pins. I'm doing running Disney merchandise shows, like all this stuff, or like all those designer boxes that you know me and Cat got into the, at the end of last year. Like I know I knew nothing about that, but like I, that's what I, I that's the thrill is finding something new that I could find profitable with stuff that I would have just thrown away. I thought that yeah. stuff would an empty box. So that's garbage. No, this empty box is worth fifty bucks. Like no idea you know so it's finding items that i finding brand new items and just expanding my knowledge that's my favorite thing to source i, I want to add something too because um that's a good thing too because like at least in my situation because it's mostly estate sales the margins are tighter so you have to find items that they don't know anything about so it yeah. kind of forces you to learn these off the wall stuff. that's that's what i like i that's can find like. something anywhere you drop me i don't care where yeah. you put me i will find something that will sell and that's actually like the Goodwill video that's coming out tonight. Like the, their polos were $13, 13 friggin' dollars, $12 for golf shorts. But I found stuff and I filled up my cart. So I, I want to say when I first started, I bought stuff that I liked that I thought other people will like and nobody liked it. Mm. I like I'm being 100 percent real. That's where you don't look stuff up. You assume because you like it, other people will like it. And that's not always true. You might, if you're good and know the trends and know exactly what's going on, 
yes, but I am so not in with the trends. I don't know what is in right now, especially with clothes. I have no friggin' clue. I wear t-shirts and sleepy pants and that is it. And if I buy what I like, it probably would not sell. Now, the only thing I bought, like I'm a horrible about buying Tervis tumblers because I like them and they do sell, but they don't sell for much. Um, I just buy them because I like them. But right now I don't have, I'm waiting on like the next big buy right now. That's where I'm at. Cause like our boxes are over half gone. We just got in all these vintage t-shirts. I, I just, yeah, I would, I'm not standing up. I'm wearing pink and gray plaid. Is that how you say it? They, everybody yells at me, plaid, plaid, whatever, fuzzy, sleepy pants, right? You never see the bottom half of me. Do you guys not <laughs> notice that? Um, yeah, sleepy pants. Even during the day, I work for myself. I'm lounging, man. I'm not going. Out. I'm wearing like workout clothes in the morning, go to the gym, and then I'm coming home and putting on comfy clothes and being a bum while I'm working, not being a bum. Um, <laughs> work on the top, party on the, it's not, no, it's like sleep <laughs> on the bottom. Work on top, sleep on the bottom. Um, but so I don't have like a favorite thing. I'm trying to learn more about women's clothes because I really don't know about women's clothes because I don't know the trends. Again, I wear t-shirt and sleepy pants. Um, see, look, look, okay. This is my members watching my live shipping. You see the sleepy pants or the yoga pants or whatever <laughs> I have on. That's what you get for being in the top tier. You get to see it, how it really is. Um, that's why that's why that's so, the highest level. I don't know this, but Kevin put out a video or Trash of Cash put out a video yet this morning where for their podcast and Kevin's wearing his sleepy pants. So now you guys are gonna start a new trend. Kat and Kevin and our trendsetters, sleepy pants for the resellers. There you guys go. Why so, not? We work for ourselves, we work yeah. at home. Why not be comfortable? I'm like, surprised he's right? not selling the sleepy pants with his yeah. Commonwealth picture and logo on it. Yeah, he, he nobody would want my sleepy pants. Kevin's pants. Kevin I tells stories so people would buy his pants. <laughs> he tells me to bite him. Like, what? I just gave him a compliment. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <proud>. <laughs> All right. What editing program do you use for your YouTube videos? Uh, when I'm not lazy, DaVinci. But if I'm lazy, I use InShot. 100% DaVinci. I want to switch to DaVinci, but I use very basic iMovie. I use KineMaster. Because I edit everything on my phone. Squirrely reseller just thought of a million dollar idea. I do take commissions. Um, Rod's wife, Kevin's wife, Blue Ridge Mama could make a reality show reseller housewives. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Coming up next on a YouTube channel near you. The housewives of reseller county. Yeah. They're all just they're all just yelling at us because we piled too much crap throughout the house and we put a resell and they want us to buy I more. To, I was trying to pitch an idea to uh to the to the guys in the trash to cash. I was saying we should do a reseller cruise and just go to Puerto Rico and just source from there and just ship out from there. I just saw who's doing somebody's doing a cruise. Like one of the people I watch for working out is doing a cruise. Yeah, go sourcing in Puerto Rico. I want. Is there a lot to source in Puerto Rico? Have you been there, Matt? I've been there. Um, there's a lot of interesting there you know, things there that you won't find in the mainland states. Um, I think there's a possibility. Be, that sounds cool. All right, let me give you a dolphin, and then we're gonna let everybody say goodbye and call it a night. Here you go. Super Yeah, see, Kevin Kevin is like, I'm 100% on my phone with KineMaster. Um, I've never edited a video on a computer either. It, it I hate blow, the way Kevin edits. <laughs> <laughs> it will blow your mind, though, if you guys actually knew how many big-time resellers do not, or big-time YouTubers edit on their phones and don't yeah. use a computer. I Kevin, bought a gaming Kevin. laptop yeah. just to edit on, and I was like, no, I like my phone. So now I just use my laptop for a laptop, Retro but I bought like one yeah. that could handle, but I didn't do it. I know Retro Rick did it like over a hundred thousand. He was editing just from his phone before he got uh, people to edit. And then like what the hails, they, they told me they edit directly on their phone. They have over 500,000 subs. That's, That's all he does is right on his phone. 
I, I, I came across InShot and I tried that. Like, it's pretty damn good. And then I heard Kevin did it. And I go, oh, is Kevin approved? Okay, I'll, I'll start using it too. If Kevin can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you're right honest. <laughs> All right, I'm going to make Matt big and then Cam, let them tell you bye. Rod will tell you what he's got going on. So here, and then I'll tell you, here's Matt. Well, thank you guys for watching. I want to give a special thanks to uh, Kat and Rod. Uh, it was so much fun. Uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, I'm going on a cruise. Um, I'm hoping to do like maybe a vlog style of the cruise, show you how it is and everything. And then after that, I'm trying to get an interview with an estate sale company so you can learn their side of the business nice. to put, you know, fill in the gaps and everything. And then uh, I just want to say, once I hit a thousand, um, I'm going to uh, get do a giveaway of a Rolo printer. And um, on my community tab on YouTube, there's a voting that's going on where you could decide what I'm going to eat. Right now, I'm I'm going towards a Goliath beetle, so that's that's going to be either a <laughs> subtraction of my subscribers or or added bonus. <laughs> Perfect. Here's Cam. Huge props to all you guys. Seriously, thank you guys so much for honestly having me on here. I didn't think I could ever get on a podcast. I, I was on a few other ones before, but honestly, thank you, Nat, Nurse Flipper, and of course Rod. Couldn't have done anything if it weren't for all you guys watching. And honestly, Rod, you are a big person. Thank you so much for everything, dude. And if you guys want to like keep learning about reselling, honestly, the best advice I can give you is just do your own research. Uh, obviously, you're going to watch the, the gurus on YouTube. You're going to watch us. We will tell you everything we know, but the best research you can do is by your own mind and yourself. More you learn... Don't forget to plug your channels. Well, I'm, oh, my what? plug? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Make sure to subscribe. Cameron Bowser is actually my whole name on YouTube. If you just put that in, you'll see it right there. And I upload around like three videos a month. And every time you guys watch it, you're never going to miss any knowledge. Trust. <laughs> Perfect. Rod, what's going on? I dropped a new video today. Me and Mrs. Punchin went garage sailing over the uh, weekend. Punchin? Mrs. Punchin, yep. If you want, she went with me. She's the boss. She makes you buy. It's, it's, you know, I take her with me, and I always spend money I don't need to spend. Um, but it's fun to go and pick up with her. Um, I dropped my flipping and punching video tomorrow, and uh, I got. I'm gonna do. You know, if you guys like wrestling figures, I'm gonna do a big blowout. I had too much inventory of wrestling figures. I'm gonna do a blowout and whatnot. Five bucks. I'm gonna blow out all my wrestling figures here coming up soon. All my backup inventory. So make sure you guys follow me on there. Nice. All right. I am putting it in the chat right now because it is dropping right this second. My new cat's treasure hunting. It is at the Goodwill with crazy lamp lady and drew um, didn't throw her name all in there, but Jocelyn and I went shopping before she left the state and hung out with the kids. And also next week, Rod is not here. He is taking a vacation week, which he is allowed to do. So my good friend, George, the antique nomad is going to be my co-host. And we are going to have my good friend, Sam from Jolie Flips and Matt Gregg Antiques. He is new. George suggested him. So he's a new channel to us. So we'll have an antique seller on if you guys have questions for that. And I dropped the catch treasure hunting and then I should have a video out on here tomorrow. Yet I have not made it yet. Um, but I appreciate Matt and Cam coming on. You guys definitely check out their channels, Rod. Thank you. Next week I'm going to be like, I can't thank Rod. He didn't come. Um, <laughs> But thank you for coming. I appreciate all of you in the chat. We are here every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And we'll see you guys on the next one. Bye, guys. Yeah. Yeah.